Ok, muy bien. Este, en honor a nuestros huéspedes. And in order to make a tribute to our guests, I would like to thank you on behalf of the FIDA, of the International Fund of Agricultural Development. Bien, voy a darles un... I'm from this IFAD outfit, which is based in Rome and operates about everywhere you wouldn't expect it. Now, let me see how this works. I'm going to run you quickly through a, um, a scene setting and the dynamics of um, the morning sessions. And actually, oops. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, oh, I see, it's on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm on an old-fashioned computer which has it somewhere else. Right. Um, the idea is, of course, that you listen to me. And you're not going to read all those things that are on the screen. That doesn't only apply to um, my presentation here, the scene setting and the dynamics, but fundamentally to the presentations that we will be sharing from people and with people from what we call the South. Now, this map, of course, is... Um, somewhat distorted vision of what you would expect the world to look like. You would expect a nice blue circle, which we call planet Earth. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't look like that. This is what it looks like. And actually, this is a, um, what might be called a distorted picture of why we are here today. And why we are here today is, of course, to give sense to water corporation. So water corporation, in this particular case, is a driver to combat child malnutrition. And that's the map you see. So we have uh, a representatives uh, today from India, which is the big yellow blob on the top right-hand corner. We also have representatives here from uh, Central America and South America, which is that funny little snake in the left bottom part of your graph. And then, of course, we have uh, good old Africa in the middle. And uh, I'm afraid that our friends from Ethiopia, which is the pinkish blob in Africa, couldn't make it today because he had a, a very urgent family affair. So um, this is just to remind me why we are, we are here. Josefina shared with us the transboundary aspects. Well, uh, you know better than I how many transboundary affairs um, we, um, we have. Now, let's complicate life just a little bit. Uh, our friend from the bank, where is Weeby today? Is he still uh, missing? He's still around, yeah. Is he still around? Weeby, good morning. Um, just um, as, as most of us do, two-dimensional model. Here on the one axis, the vertical axis, you can read the capacity of the state or the government to intervene. And we've called this a supportive macro institutional framework, which basically is difficult language to say the capacity of the government to um, service the contract with its citizens. And on the horizontal axis, you can see unfavorable or favorable local conditions. And for sake of simplicity, we're going to call this the strength of farmers, whether they're organized or whether they're not organized. So on the left hand, you can imagine that this means that farmers are weak, and on the right hand, you can imagine that farmers are strong. Now, why would we be operating in the so-called A quadrant, the top right-hand corner, where everything is right? The government is strong, the farmers are strong, and this is why we are here today in the Ebro Authority. We could be in Mexico, we could be in, uh, in France. The question is, should we be intervening there at all? If you go to the lower left-hand box, which is called Quadrant C, where everything is wrong and mixed up. Weak governments, weak farmers. Well, what should we be doing there? And of course, there's the inconvenient answers. The inconvenient answer is don't try collective state irrigation, for instance, because it doesn't work. Ah, but if that doesn't work and we're the water community here, what is the, what's the next job for us? With this quadrant C, Rudolf is putting us all out of a job. That's not very fair, is it? So, thank God I've got an alternative there, which means either you go to individual irrigation by tube wells and what have you not, so little vives, and the bigger the pump, the better, or you go to management substitution, whereby the capacities or the lack of 
capacities is recognized by the players and they accept through negotiations and water cooperation that a third party provides the so required services. As I said, an inconvenient truth. In the D quadrant, where government is strong and farmers are weak, well, you would expect, of course, the Indian state to deliver to the services to the farmers, millions of them. So there, there's no room, actually, for turnover or participatory irrigation management or all these fashionable things that we've been believing in over the last 20 years. And in the B quadrant, the lower right-hand bottom, where government is weak and farmers are strong, the big blob in the middle, that's where the water users come in, that's where the associations come in, that's where the federations come in, that's where you have your turnover, that's where you have your participation. So, it basically means don't expect today that when we are sharing experiences from the South, among the South, and with you here with our hosts from the EBRA, and of course the international audience, that we are transfixed on one setting only, the Water Users Association's world of wisdom. We go beyond borders. That is the session of this morning. Now, this is being broadcast, so it's extremely silent. And I would have expected some giggles, some laughs, people saying, what is this? Well, what you see is what you get. And what you see is what you get also means that you need to think beyond the traditional, think beyond what your, is your immediate image of a situation. You have to ponder, you have to sit back, you have to think again, take another angle. Put yourself in the shoes, or maybe if you're a, a landless farmer, no shoes. Put yourself in the, in the boots of a, an extension worker, and what do you perceive as the situation? Well, if we go beyond the traditional uh, water users, we have to think along the value chain of water. Not just for primary production, but also along transformation, consumption, and recycling. Now, that doesn't mean that us, water professionals, and that includes the farmers. By the way, is there a farmer in the room? Could I have one hand up? Hay algún productor aquí con nosotros? One. Two. Buenos días. Dos representantes rurales en un mundo urbano. Qué interesante estos ejercicios auspiciados por las Naciones Unidas. Tendríamos que tener una visión similar a lo que está en la pantalla. Obviamente estamos viendo el mundo campesino con una visión, por lo menos, no bifocal. So, again, you see what you see is what you get, and we need to change maybe our perspectives. By the way, is there anybody who has a specific opinion about what we're seeing here? No. Interaction with the audience is still very weak this morning. All right, so the mira, the crosshairs, what we shoot at. Water Corporation usually looks at the top right quadrant, primary production, water for agriculture. Well, of course, because that consumes 80% of all fresh water. We usually do not look as water professionals in what water needs we require and what water cooperation we require for transformation of all that wonderful agriculture, livestock, forestry, or whatever you're not, products. And it's not so much the water that we need, but it's also the pollution that goes with it. And then, of course, the regular suspects on the left-hand side of the quadrant are the water footprint by consumers. I've just thrown away eight kilos of food last week if I'm a regular European. Now, that's a hell of a lot of water that I've been throwing away, isn't it? Still, the room seems to be very sleepy. Very good. Well, and last but not least, the favorites of, um, of all the tree huggers and uh, environmentalists, the recycling of water, yes. Of nutrients, yes. Of energy, yes. And it comes with the awareness. So if we go beyond traditional borders, please 
go and look beyond the first top right hand quadrant. Now, um, with that, I've uh, I said enough, uh, almost enough. Uh, this is, of course, why we are here today. Not because we're um, some, um, a set of, of old water professionals, but actually because there's this whole new generation, about four billion of them, out there, of these kids. So that's why we're here. Remember the first slide? Well, obviously these kids do, um, do not live in, uh, in Africa or in one of the big blobs in, um, in Asia. Okay, so what are we going to be doing today? We're going to uh, go through a, a very quick and dynamic series of short presentations by our colleagues from different countries that you see on the left-hand side. We are mixing the presentations with short interventions by panelists that will be called after um, the presentation to the table because otherwise they can't see the presentation. And this means that the reaction of the panelists is going to be quite spontaneous because they have not seen the presentations nor have they possibly read all the background materials. Then, most importantly, we have per presentation session 10 minutes of your precious time the audience, to interact, not with me, please, yeah? but particularly amongst yourselves, inspired maybe by the presentation, to exchange views on what water cooperation tools work in the context or in the setting that has been highlighted by the case. So we mix the panels. You may see a familiar face in each or every panel, but usually we would mix the panels. And then, after a coffee break, which may be around 11 o'clock, and I'm not going to announce exactly when, so to keep you on your toes, we will close up um, around 1 o'clock with a, uh, a wrap-up, a way forward, and linkages to not only the International UN Year of Water Cooperation, and you've seen a slide with about 26,000 events yesterday, but basically about the next steps to this very afternoon on linkages between cities and of course trying to set up some kind of informal networking mechanism amongst yourselves to create a further momentum that will contribute to the um, say combating malnutrition. With that I would like to, um, to invite the, uh, the first speaker to um, our session, and that will be my colleague Lucho Salazar, Luis Salazar, from Bolivia, who I have had the pleasure of knowing for over 30 years, as we found out yesterday, and we've been working together there. So, Lucho, the floor is yours. Por favor, venga, búsquete tu uh, presentación. Te voy a cortar a los cinco minutos, y después te doy al último minuto, porque tienes diez minutos nomás. Bueno, sea que sea, sea Humberto, sea Lucho, porque es el caso Tiraca Punata. Entonces, Humberto Ganderías. Bien, buenos días. El caso que les voy a presentar eh, dista mucho de los casos que ayer hemos visto. Ayer hemos visto casos macro. Ahora voy a eh, contarles sobre un caso micro, una experiencia que eh, la hemos tenido ya hace 20 años en Cochabamba, Bolivia, pero tiene una gran relevancia porque eh, resulta que se va reproduciendo una y otra vez el mismo tipo de problemas, el mismo tipo de errores. Se trata de las visiones diferentes del riego que tenemos los técnicos y las visiones que tienen los campesinos, los indígenas, particularmente en este caso en los Andes. Es un problema de interculturalidad, 
en un proyecto que tiene el nombre de Tiraque Punata en Cochabamba, Bolivia. Es un proyecto ubicado en, en valles interandinos que eh, consiste en la construcción de varias pequeñas presas para el regadío de unas zonas altas, alrededor de 3.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar, y otros valles un poquito más bajos, alrededor de 2.500 metros sobre el nivel del mar. El área de riego en total es de unas 8.500 hectáreas para beneficiar unas 5.000 familias. Y acá el pecado original fue que el proyecto tuvo una marcadísima tendencia a la construcción de obras. Estuvo fuertemente orientado a ejecutar obras, a resolver problemas de eficiencia, aumentar la dotación de agua y se olvidó aspectos clave como la organización social, la participación de los beneficiarios, etc. En este caso, he puesto acá una... Uh, this is a picture by Kino, a famous Argentinian comic uh, drawer, or cartoonist. And uh, apparently uh, the interested people, the users, final users, were not asked what were their interests. Well, in this case, uh, the channel network or the canal network for the uh, distribution of water was not uh, conceived initially with the proper focus as uh, having a social context. In an area where there was already an irrigation tradition, we were thinking of uh, increasing significantly the water offer through the construction and enlargement of some small dams. Uh, the empirical phase uh, was thought to be um, exceeded or surpassed in the water handling in going uh, into going towards a technification, improving efficiency and getting a best um, profitability of or harnessing the use of water. Well, there were blocks uh, that were efficiently conceived according to the topography, but these blocks were not coinciding with the communal territories. In the Andes, the social organization establishes communities which have uh, some social control mechanisms their own mechanisms. Here, engineering tried to establish new ways of doing things and established blocks that should be more efficient uh, to distribute water because they were according the topography and mechanisms that theoretically should make uh, water management more efficient. But they didn't consider the social context at all. Really, it is society which makes things work. Basically, as an example, I want to show you these um, drawings. The blocks, the irrigation blocks were established, as you can see here. We, uh, the, some canals were made for these blocks, but these uh, canals were not respecting the distribution of the communities. Normally, these communities establish internal mechanisms that allow them to make a successive trans, uh, transmission through flows according to uh, the time parameter. They establish times, different times, for every user to have to receive their right to water. With this construction, with this structure, this was not possible and consequently the, uh, all the matter failed, all the project failed. As the success of irrigation depends on the fact that distribution and application of water is well supported by organizations and institutions, this derived into a conflict and the uh, management authority tried to solve, it, solve this conflict without having any capacity or ability to do it. <clears throat> so this emerges as a key factor when organizing uh, 
these plans with users. So there were dialogues for the first time with the users in order to establish a new map. And the communities were uh, converted into the managers of their own water. But then we had an institutional conflict because firstly we needed new funds, new money, in order to demolish the canals that did not work and of course to build the new canals. And these demands and intense work of participatory design. For the first time, the users, the communities, were participating in the design. And they were defining the definite characteristics of the system with enough clarity. And here I want to emphasize the uh, social cultural problem. In general, we have different visions. The technical conception of the irrigation differs, at least in the Andes, of the uh, peasant vision of uh, water and agriculture. The indigenous, indigenous peoples are very much familiarized, are accustomed to agriculture. And we have, we the technicians, have a university training that tries to follow European models in this case, this led to many problems in Bolivia. Again, I wanted to use one of Kino's cartoons. You see a world which is square, and he is being scolded because he is working on a little spiral that is something that is not matching the square world where he is living. OK, among the key learnings or keen lessons to be learned, we have to orientate the cooperation towards the uh, ability development, strengthening conception, design, construction, and the management of the irrigation systems in two ways. Institutions and the technicians foster the development of concepts and methodologies that allow to assess and enhance the knowledge and practices of the users, and then the, also the organizations of irrigators support the development of their negotiation capacity or ability, and uh, they also support the fact of uh, being heard. Normally, we institutions and technicians develop some projects, and these projects are for the users. And this, in general, has not been working successfully in the Andes. We propose that the users establish their proposals and needs. The institutions should also uh, give or provide some services. And through a process of interaction, of cooperation, we can develop projects that can be handled and managed autonomously by the users. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Umberto. That was magnificent, splendid. I would like to invite to the, uh, the table as panelists, Robina. There's Robina. She's coming over there. Antonieta and Immaculada, who doesn't have a, a card. Ima. Ima, this is to you. Very well. Um, Rubina, now that, you're, now that you're here at the table, um, Rubina is with FAO, our sister organization in Rome, extensive uh, experience in canal irrigation and plenty more. So probably very well placed at the table here to uh, let your light shine on this quite, um, I would say, interesting presentation by uh, Umberto. Um, Umberto referred to 8,500 hectares, 5,000 families as the overall, uh, say, area of intervention. Now, in a recent study that FAO have uh, undertaken, you uh, have found that as from 5,000 hectares up, a system becomes sufficiently large to allow for professional management services. Now, having listened to Umberto, how appropriate is that statement in the context that he's just shared? 
Um, thank you, Rudolf, and good morning, everybody. Uh, let me just explain a, a little bit on, on, on the study. The study was, uh, what we did was mostly for, for medium to large scale irrigation systems. Obviously, then the system in Bolivia fits in there um, very well. Um, and uh, the results are such that large uh, water users associations, for example, are strong. That does not necessarily mean they're performing very well, but they are a strong water users association, and for the reasons that when 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 the large associations are are, are built or are are, are developed, um, they are usually uh, supported by the laws, so they're legal. They have um, uh, legal authorities. Uh, they have um, uh, help from the outside, from the legal system, from the authorities, local authorities to intervene into the system when something um, uh, happens. And um, uh, they, uh, they have um, um, uh, critical mass, and, and, and they, they are large enough to collect uh, funds from, their, from, 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 from the members, as well as from um, they are, they're able to get loans and, and, and funds from our sites to be able to survive. So by the virtue of the size, it's, it's, it's more sustainable in that sense. Now, having said that, we know that there are other systems in Nepal, for example, the small systems which are um, farm, farmers manage and they work very well. The point is, uh, and also Umberto said, that okay, farmers can manage and, 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 and um, there have to be institutions. Our study also um, um, says that whether it's water user association or whether it's, uh, it's, it's um, government institutions and semi-autonomous bodies who are managing the system, what is important is to manage it professionally. What is important is the uh, service-oriented approach, which is very important. Now, if an agency has a service-oriented approach and they have a, a good flow of information and communication with the users, they can do a very good job as well. Probably the problem with Bolivia was that there was that 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 um, link was not there, so and that was probably the problem not of the water user association. It's the managers and water user association, obviously, because it's based on farmers and they communicate more with the farmers. So in that sense, yes. One last thing that I want to say is what we found out is the um, systems. Irrigation systems which were, for, which were performing better were the ones where there were good incentives and sanctions placed for employees. So where the employees were treated well or there were clear guidelines for employees to, to, to a clear set of activities, clear set of responsibilities, clear set of sanctions. And these were the systems which were performing better in terms of providing water delivery service to different users and different users. Thank you very much, Robina. Y con eso pasamos a, al Perú, a Antonieta. Eh, ustedes en el Perú tienen una nueva ley. Antonieta, leira. you have a new water law that has envisioned a better cooperation between the mountain range and the coast. Humberto was talking about a system with headwaters and downwaters. What do you have to offer? or an interchange in the future. Well, thank you. In Peru last year, we had this new water law where we recognize water as a national heritage. And the intention is to be able to handle water better all throughout the country. As far as I could heard from Humberto, he tried to uh, interact uh, headwaters and low waters. This is not very well expressed or very clear in our law, this interaction, because in the Peruvian case, uh, if we compare coast and the highlands, you can have uh, like three hours only by car, so it's not really far. But in the case of Cochabamba, uh, the low waters knew what was happening 
in the headwaters. In our, the Peruvian case, this is not so. For example, the case of Mayeque in Chiclayo is a big, it's a large city with uh, industrial, industrial companies, uh, exports, etc. But only three hours up, there is this, the poorest people, uh, not even the Quechua culture is a culture of the Cañaris. So there was a total lack of knowledge of both peoples the uh, headwater people and the low water people. And this is only three hours far away, one from the other, but this, of course, uh, makes it difficult to have an interrelationship. Normally, in the project, we either oriented them or focused them to the uh, land or to the city, but we don't tend to interact while in spite of the fact that there is a very narrow relationship, not only a social relationship, but also a cultural relationship between the uh, fields and the farms and also the city. I am very happy, and thank you, Josefina, for giving me the opportunity to be here to speak about this uh, intercultural relationship and how transborder relationships involves us all, us, the people who work in the, in the fields and in the countryside and how these people living in the borders live and what the conditions are. This interculturality is also been, uh, is existing in our um, country. Well, I forgot to say that Antonieta is the director of a Peruvian project in the North Mountain Range of the country. And uh, she will be here uh, during the whole day uh, to interact with you. Okay, now let's move to move on to Inmaculada. Inmaculada is with Spanish Corporation. She has been working also in Guatemala and covering services there, services that are linked to water. When you listen to these uh, relationships, uh, headwaters, stormwaters, and uh, the technical vision compared to the peasant vision, you as an entity, how do you handle the tools, or what are the tools that you use to try to bridge these two visions that are not always compatible? From the point of view of Spanish cooperation, we've always faced some of the aspects that you were talking, uh, Umberto, uh, the fellow colleague of Bolivia. On the one hand, the compatibility between the technical vision and the beneficiary's vision, and on the other hand, the integration of the different beneficiaries' communities. And in this sense, I want to say that this has meant or has led to a delay in the project but this meant um, that we had to explain and to involve uh, the uh, communities of beneficiaries and uh, communities of owners, the owners' communities from the beginning. Uh, we, it was clear to us that we had, from the beginning, we had to uh, interrelate with all the communities and explain to them every one of the projects. And another thing I want to say is the water integrated management. Um, many times among the users' communities, there are conflicts for the use of the water resource. And this is a very complex uh, problem because in many cases on a national level, there is a lack of institutions or one institution that could bridge all the users' communities, making a share of this um, water use. We are trying to work on a more reduced level with the communities in order to mitigate or palliate this problem. 
And I think this is uh, an unresolved matter. Thank you very much, Immaculada, for uh, having uh, explained this to us. Now, I'd like to invite the plenary. to uh, make a round of questions of 10 minutes, especially addressing Umberto, of course. Um, among all of you who, among all of you uh, belonging to the uh, Ebro River Water Authority, who work for other uh, authorities? I am expecting your questions. I mean, you people that do not work in the Ebro River Water Authority, because this is the occasion to ask, uh, to make questions about the North and the South. I don't want everybody to speak. Uh, well, everybody, um, of co obviously, ladies first. I would like to see some hands raised. Please, uh, let's introduce yourself and then um, take uh, the floor. Use a microphone, please, and speak clearly. Thank you. Good morning. I am Ines Torralba. I am in charge of the users area in the water commissariat uh, having control on the users' communities. In the Ebro River Basin, we have over 2,000 uh, communities of users. Not all of them are the same size, of course. There is a high variety, and there is uh, there are very large communities working almost as an agency or an administration, such as the Ebro River Water Authority, and there are also basic and small communities. It has drawn my attention, the, the Bolivian problem has drawn my attention because it is interesting to me uh, to see the uh, lack of coincidence and the lack of relationship between the users and the technicians because we had the same problem here the different irrigation sectors and the technicians and normally mm, we uh, didn't uh, use the um, social base. We normally ignored the social base in our problems, and in many cases we tried to modify the users' communities uh, in what we think, we the technicians think, are the best uh, solutions for the users. Okay, we are going to take three questions, and then Umberto is going to answer all of them in a row, okay? Hello, I'm Cesar Trillo. I'm the president of irrigation of the High Aragon and the president of irrigators of the Ebro Basin. I have been in Latin America, in two countries, speaking with irrigators, in Mexico and Argentina. And um, I was shocked by the uh, Bolivian case because we're talking about 5,000 hectares. Um, I don't know if they, these canals depend on only one um, input and or one uh, uptake point and we are talking about very small communities if these communities are not unified in what we call here general communities that is groupings of uh, smaller communities we're talking about groups well there are too many groups in order to unify criteria. Here, well, I am the president of uh, one community irrigating 135,000 hectares, composed by 54 basic communities or small communities. But these 54 communities, basic communities, 
have to follow the rules and have to abide by the rules. And among these 54 communities, these laws are established and they are strong in the sense that when you have to um, give an opinion on a project, you have a representation there. And here we unify ourselves in basic communities. Your question is if whether they are viable, these small groupings? Yes. I mean, we should tend to unify these uh, small communities. These 5,000 hectares cannot have only one uh, 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 cannot have many voices. They should have a single voice. Okay, we will cut here. Thank you. This is a very nice question of you and a very nice question from the ladies. So please, just one more question. Okay, the young people. You say that all we're doing here is for the youth, but I'm quite surprised that there is no more, not a lot of youth here. So, as part of the as part of the communities as well as as w I was wondering, what do you do f not only for the youth but with the youth? Thank you very much, Umberto. Three simple questions. Three minutes right. to answer. Muy bien. Voy a tratar de contestar. Okay, I'm gonna try to answer to the first two questions, which are more or less interlinked between them. And I think it's important to make reference, perhaps, the, to the fact that the peasants communities and indigenous communities in Bolivia are merged or are living in territories of about 100 hectares, no more than 100 families. And within those communities, we have got very intense bonds of integration and cooperation. So there is a mechanism of reciprocity of common efforts in order to try to solve problems which are faced by all of them regarding the climate, the health. Sorry, we cannot listen to, to the, yeah, the capacity of uh, farming the land and uh, in general the property, the ownership of the land is within these 100 hectares it is allocated one hectare, two hectares per family, so the amount of earth is very, very small, and they need to set up mechanisms of cooperation, of mutual cooperation. And it is very difficult to establish, to set up bigger territories in order to try to modify the schemes of water management. So what uh, the lady has mentioned before, this is something very difficult, and what you mentioned too, because it wouldn't be possible to think of expanding those territories, of enlarging them, searching for mechanisms that should be more efficient. Efficient should be searched for in this dimension of the territory, which is led to the young people because there's another perspective. And the question of the colleague is uh, of the water use associations, is that the communities are the fundamental basis of the users' organization, so the community is the basis which makes up this water user association. Okay, and regarding the young people, alguien como tú, joven. There is a trend at the moment in Bolivia to leave. Uh, the farming areas, to reach the rural areas, so only old people remain there in the communities. And it is much more difficult with the old people to amend things. So it is like this. We, we experience that every day, don't we? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the presentation and the panelists and, of course, the plenary. And um, I would invite now Umberto to uh, take a seat in the audience, have Santiago up here. Uh, Rubina can stay as a panelist, then I'd like to have Faith over here on the panel, so Antonietta, you can, um, you can uh, go. Lucho, please take the seat of, um, of uh, Immaculada. Tam. So we'll have Rubina and Faith and Lucho Salazar, who will be probably looking over their shoulders at the presentation.
¿Lo puedes eh, llamar? ¿Ah? ¿Lo puedes eh, abrir? Sí, es que la está reconociendo todavía. La está reconociendo todavía. Sí. Está escaneando. Sí. En el momento, 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 The panelists, we have um, Robina, as I introduce you from FAO, we have Faith Livingston from Kenya, project director of the Mount Kenya East pilot project, an enormous uh, project and also enormously successful. She will uh, later explain you how and what. And we have uh, Lucho Salazar, who is taking Immaculada's place. Si quiere, si. Yeah. Lucho Salazar is also part of the, the Bolivian um, statal apparatus and he will close this morning sessions with also um, lots of fireworks on um, what is happening in uh, Bolivia. So, in the meantime, are you ready? Um, estamos? Está abriendo. The presentation from, um, from Guatemala is based on the introduction of micro-irrigation systems. Um, is the technology the driving force or is the objective of reducing household and livelihood um, sustenance the, um, the driver? And in that case, does health come before wealth or is wealth buying health? Now, that's the dichotomy that we will look into now and what cooperation mechanisms were introduced and with what degree of success these have led to uh, the achievement of the objectives of the intervention. Santiago. He insisted very much that he does a better PR of his organization than I would. Uh, good morning to you all. I represent the Rural Development Coffee Fund, uh, which is the social arm of Anna Coffee, Anna Cafe. And today I'm going to talk about uh, a project supported by FIDA in Guatemala about the small systems of micro-irrigation as an introduction with an approach of the nourishment and food safety. We cannot isolate that topic from the, wat from the water topic and we cannot do it on the other way around because they are really linked with the management of water. As Fon Cafe Coffee Fund, we are working in three strategic areas. The area, obviously, of nourishment and food safety, the topic of health, working on projects of preventive and healing health, and also the topic of education and training with an integrative approach, working on methodologies of rural active schools with a wide participation of the community. The coverage that we have got this is a map that it is not updated, but can really give us a very good idea about the wide coverage we have got. We are at the national level in 20 of the 22 departments that Guatemala is made of. And nowadays, we have to do, we try to give service to uh, more than 350 families per year, and we are giving service, healthcare service, to three, yeah, 350,000, 3,500 3, families, and then more than 150,000 150, people per year, young people per year. So where you have got the circles, as we, we have got the intervention area, and this is the trust area of Guatemala, and therefore this is the area of Guatemala with the most difficult poverty conditions and also we have got to the north area in the area of Cobón, in the heights of La Paz and the Quiche area too. It is also very important to mention that we are working on three models. One of them is the model of joint work with the government with a politic, a national politic, with a program funded also by FIDA 
And in the case of the Haze of the Path, we have worked with this municipality of Elcoa, so this was a joint work. And in the area of Quiche, we have been working with an association of producers, which already had a very important management level, and they are exporting their products also to North America too. So these three models also have got different cultures. We are talking about the Chorti culture in the area of the Heights of La Paz, about the Quechi culture, and in the Kitsi area, about the Ekiche culture, which is a different one too. So all this strip that you are seeing in this uh, coffee farming land where our cafe is intervening, but we are not restricted to this area. But thanks to the cooperation, we can also introduce ourselves in our areas too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the results of the interventions of the project through the micro-irrigation. We could introduce new crops in the communities, and it was achieved the fact that these uh, communities would have available food for the self-consumption, and we increased the figures both uh, in the eastern area and in Kuban, 13 crops additional to the usual diet of the producers, and in the Kitsche area, 12 additional crops. The availability of food in Guatemala, we suffered four months of scarcity, of lack of food. And we, through the intervention of this project, we have achieved to increase the time of availability to 15 weeks in the eastern area, 21 in Coban area, and 12 in Kitsche. So in this way, it was also reduced the amount of water that was used for the application of irrigation in the crops, having a bigger impact in the Kichi area, because in that area, the producers have got crops with a kind of non-point irrigation of a sprinkle irrigation. So the main reason of this intervention of micro-irrigation was really in order to improve the life quality of people, the life standards of people. And I'm going to give you some examples. It always happens something with the PowerPoint whenever you want to show some examples. About the producers in Guatemala, we also intervene in the schools because we cannot talk about food safety if we are not approaching youth, as our colleague has said. We intervene at the schools, we offer attention, and we introduce technology there, and then the students have learned to use the technology in order to improve their productive systems, and they have been monitored from the premises to the production and consumption of this food. So we gave a step forward in a step forward yeah, to, to intervene in this project. We can observe the children there making the harvesting those products with this uh, micro-irrigation system. At the family level, we also work very strongly on this family component. And we see that the main focus is addressed to women. In Guatemala, we suffer from chronic undernourishment. One out of two children are really suffering from this uh, from this malady. And with this project, what we try to do is that the family becomes the owner of this technology in order to improve their own production systems, and in this way, to improve the diversification and consumption of food. Now, we have learned from this new technology, and we want also to reflect it in other areas, such as the one of the Western areas. So I do not have anything else to say but thanking you for your attention. And I'm going to give the floor to Inmaculada so that he can tell us a little bit about the case in the Western area when we are going to start our expansion this year onwards. Thank you very much, Santiago. Organic presentations, you never know what you get. So. Immaculada will have. How long is your presentation, Immaculada? ¿Cuánto uh, tiempo necesitas? Cinco minutos, menos. Tres minutos, muy Tres bien. Tres minutos. Three minutes, that's lovely.
to just to give you a brief contest in Alsif. What we have got is a fund focused on drinkable water and sanitization just for Latin America and rural and peri-urban areas. This fund until now has got 100 million euros that have been given in donations and a very important part of it is located in Guatemala. The main problem that we have found when we are working in rural areas is that with this fund we have got three goals, the promotion of the human rights to water and the institutional re-strengthening, also this strengthening of the hydro resources and the potabilization and sanitation of water. We have got two problems mainly, one, how to approach the integrated management problems of this hydric uh, resource in rural areas and not in a wide level and the sustainability of the services. So this means many rural systems that have been built in man communities and so on have failed after five, ten years because the community didn't have the capacity neither technical nor economic to solve the problems that have emerged. We have uh, tried to stop this in the case of Guatemala working on a new focus, on a new approach. Which is the strategy in order to say this? On the one hand, to make that municipalities can become really responsible of what the law is saying they have to do, which is rendering services of water potabilization and sanitation. So enable them and re-strengthen so that the municipalities can support the communities of users which are responsible of the project. And in order to work on this uh, integrative management of the hydro resources, we have been working with the man communities which are associated to micro basins. And within them, we have got a technical capacity already installed, and of course, we do the corresponding hydrological research, researches and so on. And uh, we are talking about the scale communities, and then working very intensively, both with the citizens and also, as our colleague has said, at schools to create a specific material for the children and remarking also the importance of this uh, integrative management of the resources. We are working in Mancuerna, the municipality is represented here, it's a very strategic area because this is the head of many of the important rivers of the country. And as you can see, the area which is in blue belongs to the basin of the Naranjo River when we are working mainly on mainly basis. In my since we do not have this institutionalization and there are not bodies of powerful bodies of this um, of these uh, resources, we are working with communities with a model of micro basins. We are present from the very beginning to the end of the project and they select the technology they want for the system and they are fixing the fees they want to pay for them and they establish which is going to be the most appropriate operator if it is going to be the community or if it's going to be a company or whatever. We have changed our intervention model from an optic of projects, from a cycle of projects to a cycle of the service, and this really extends the deadlines. And the main concern from the very beginning is what is going to be the service rendered to the community, the quality, the quality of the water that is going to be obtained, the number of hours available, the fee to be paid, the use of appropriate technology and the scale economies and the community allows us to do this and this allows us to give bigger support to the municipalities and communities since we can have a technician for the whole community and uh, the work also with students the raising awareness of this basin the reforestation work uh, and also programs of environmental training and the importance of sanitization. Lovely, wonderful, a big applause, incredible, everything in three minutes. Robina. IFAD, the International Fund for Agriculture um, uh, Development, does not have rural water, health, and sanitation as its core mandate. Um, 
So we're looking for alternatives to bypass this mandate issue, because this is what women and people in the areas ask for. Uh, we've heard about multiple use systems. Can you elaborate a little bit on how you see the marriage between the purpose of, say, health um, and wealth creation? How do you see the role of multiple use systems there? Thank you. Thank you, Rudolf. Uh, multiple use systems. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you a quick example of what FAO uh, has. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so um, FAO did um, some analysis I had mentioned to you. We do um, evaluate performance of large scale irrigation systems. We, when we were doing that, we realized that most of the irrigation systems, large scale by the way, um, were, which were built mostly for monopurpose, just to provide service to farmers for irrigation, were in fact not monopurpose systems. There were several other uses of water which were already happening within the command area of these irrigation systems. And um, we, we looked at 23, and out of 23, 21 had multiple uses. So we started to investigate how to, you know, uh, to, uh, what is the role of these different uses and how the system is providing services to these different users and these different uses in, in, in within the command area of these irrigation systems. What we found out, it was very interesting. We tried to do water balance, and that's the only way you can try and see how much water is going where to which uses, and then try to see how much money was generated by these different uses. In, and, and in many of the systems, for, uh, for example, in Vietnam, uh, we found out that 30% of the total value, uh, uh, revenue that was generated within the command areas was not coming from crops, it was coming from animal farming. So same, same um, infrastructure was providing service to not uh, only to the crops, but also for animal farming, and uh, most of the, the 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 income that was generated from was from that. In France, for example, in um, in in the system Canal Saint Julien, the main purpose of the system is for flood control, drainage, transport, and environment. Eighty percent of of it. Um, in systems like in, in Sri Lanka, for example, in the oil system, our water balance um, showed that 40% of the water, actual water was used by rice, which was the main crop and for which the irrigation system was built. Most of the other water was used by the trees, by vegetation, for environment, and so on. In China, you have so many systems where water is only also this, uh, the same system is providing service to, um, uh, to environment, to tourism, for example. So all these examples are there. Um, and uh, when we look at the performance of the system, we say, okay, the irrigation, large irrigation systems are not performing well because uh, the revenue from the crop is not good enough to justify uh, the existence of these systems, but that's uh, one part of the story. The other part of the story is you want to see how important is this use for other uses? What happens if you stop canal irrigation? Are there alternative source of irrigation available for these other uses or not? Also domestic purposes. There are so many systems in the world, especially in the drier areas, and also in the areas where groundwater is not good, uh, of good quality in Pakistan, in Egypt, in, in, um, in other places, where the same system, where the same canal infrastructure is providing water to the, for domestic purposes as well, as well. Not to individual farmers, but to, at a point, to, uh, let's say, municipalities. Thank you very much, Robina. So, in short, multiple use systems may well play a role to bridge the, say, the multiple demands on a system. They, they are already doing that in most of the cases. We need to look at um, carefully if they are already doing that or not, and how do we in, improve? The point is how do we improve and how do we incorporate the, the demands from these different users into the management, officially into the management of the system, which is not happening all the time. So there are systems which are already doing that, yeah. Thank you. With that, we'll go to Kenya. Faith Livingston is the manager of the Mount Kenya East Pilot Project, uh, run by the ministry there, uh, also supported by IFAD. Um, in the Upper Tana region, where you are managing the project, Faith, women and youth are key players. Um, very often, women, the first demand is drinking water, 
and yet again, it seems not to be our mandate. The youth are not particularly interested in intensive agriculture. Uh, they rely on other, other sources for their, um, their leisure. Um, now, given the example from Guatemala with the municipalities and the, 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 say the federation of municipalities, do you see a, a similarity there with your districts and counties? And how would you, say, take the essence of this multiple use to your next um, project, which, if I'm well informed, would take 600,000 people out of poverty? Can you elaborate a bit on the issue of the municipalities and the multiple use there? Three minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the Kenyan case, it's true that uh, for most women, yeah, uh, for the rural women, their main concern is access to drinking water, um, be it from the source or when it is piped to the homes. Whereas for the youth, their main purpose or their concern is to get incomes. But the challenges are that for both the women and the youth, they do not own the land. In most cases, the ownership of the land is the male domain. The men, men own the land. So the women only till the land. The youth can only be the farmers, but they don't determine exactly what is going to be done. But the male, the grown-ups, or the fathers, uh, make the decisions. However, the water, when it's available, there are all these uh, multiple uses at the district level. And the uh, concern is on how to make sure that everybody access the same drop. And that's where the water users associations come in along the various river basins that we have in the uh, Upper Tana region. And therefore, when we are forming the water use associations, which is not a very old uh, mechanism or strategy of uh, water resource management, because this started uh, only after year 2002, when Kenya formulated the Water Act. Uh, when we are forming these associations, we make sure that we involve both the women and the youth. That's the gender considerations. So that the women can access the water for domestic use. The farmers, of which of course women are part, they can also access the same for farming and also to be involved in the decision making. The same, uh, when we form the water user associations, within the Water Act, they are the water service providers within the law. And, and even the water user associations are being rigorized so that they can make uh, viable decisions uh, to either sue those who are using the water inappropriately and uh, also they can uh, be sued if they also make inappropriate uh, regulations. Maybe this is what I would say that for the Guatemalan uh, case, uh, for the community, for us it's the community level. We really don't work at the municipality levels. Thank you very much. So maybe you're uh, now uh, challenged to take the level from the VUA up to the municipal level, district level. But we'll listen to your presentation later on. Lucho. Uh, Lucho Salazar, como había dicho, trabaja también en Bolivia. Salazar, um, as I have said before, is also working in Bolivia. And the case that we have been listening to is the one that Immaculada has shown us and also Immaculada, the municipal model as a supplier of services, a rendering services, and once that it is uh, matched with the community, could also go close to the boundaries of the basin, to the border basin. We have also listened from the, from the words of uh, Umberto is that the problem is that sometimes there are municipal territory, territorial limits that are not the same as the limit of the basin, which is the situation in Bolivia regarding to these organizations beyond just a single municipality in order to manage water.
is based on the uh, management of the territory, which is uh, provoking that on a before the territory was managed by, uh, in terms of water, managed by individual systems that did not respond to the municipal scope. We are finding that the same as we speak about uh, transborder basins, we are talking about sub-basins. Uh, and rather than transborder, we speak about transdepartmental or transsectorial. Uh, that is putting this pretension of uh, make to visibilize or make uh, the basin as a territory for water management visible, uh, putting it at risk. And so um, now we're giving responsibilities on a municipal level to the water management. This is a challenge that we are facing. It is a difficulty because this situation of non-coincidence between public administration territories and uh, resource um, allocation resource uh, territories is very difficult to um, to reconcile to the uh, these two territories we are going to ask a maximum of three questions to the plenary. Please introduce yourself and say uh, to whom are you addressing your question. And your question and to whom you uh, direct your question, please. So my name is Lucia De Stefano and uh, the question was, uh, oh, pregunto en español mejor. La pregunta es para el caso de Guatemala. Eh, normalmente el problema eh, es eh, asegurar la... That the project continues after the funds are finished. My question is, do you have something to ensure that this happens? Because uh, there is a moment where the pipe is uh, already worn out and the material is worn out. Um, have you thought of uh, any mechanism so that after 10 years, this nice project will continue? Well, firstly, I want to say that we're not talking about a macro project of thousands of pipes. We're talking about a very uh, small project, uh, 100, 100 um, square meters. And uh, maybe the uh, users can have an access to the funds through a rotatory system. They sell, for example, their production and they invest this money. No, yes, I see your hand in the back. Can we have the mic over to the back side there, please? You're going to be very tired later this morning, yes. Thanks, um, I wanted to ask uh, the woman from uh, Kenya because uh, I think uh, I think the, that in the Upper Tana Basin they have implemented the system of green water credit, right? And I was wondering if uh, once the project was finished, if the, this uh, system has been continued and if it has helped to, the, to enhance the cooperation between the different um, populations or irrigation systems. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I, I didn't catch your name, though. Uh, Beatriz, from the Univers uh, Complutense University of Madrid. Muy bien. Um, thanks, Beatriz. That's exactly the issue of the next presentation. So you were a bit too fast there. But that's always good to keep the, the mood going. So with that, I would like to thank um, Immaculada and, um, of course, uh, Santiago, as well as the, the panelists. And uh, Faith, you can now take the, the hot seat. And I would like to in invite um, Antonieta to the, uh, the panel, Susan Taranta from India, and uh, um Umberto Gandarias, who needs no further introduction. Which 
Which one? Vamos a ver si. Kenya. Yeah, we are going to close everything. In the meantime, um, before we go to uh, to Kenya and go on a safari like um, some uh, major um, officials here in Spain, um, Susan Tananta is the project director of a um, very large project in the state of Orissa in India, uh, which works in tribal areas and with uh, what we would call indigenous peoples in issues ranging from watershed management, rainwater harvesting, capacity building, um, empowerment, and of course, um, support to livelihoods and combating poverty. Um, Umberto, as we know, is uh, from Bolivia, and Antonieta was already introduced as being the manager from Sierra Norte. So that should be uh, quite an interesting um, um, setting out of Africa to see what we can learn and what we may contribute. You're ready, um, Faith? So you got 10 minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this uh, presentation covers a uh, part of one of the water catchments in uh, Kenya. And the project mainly has been in place for the last about seven years on uh, natural resource management of uh, Mount Kenya water towers. Uh, where our activities were based on uh, about five river basins. And the five rivers drain into the main river, which is River Tana. Uh, within Kenya, uh, we know that sustainable, secure, and water supply is the foundation for any human development. And in the Kenyan constitution, everyone is entitled to clean and safe environment, of which water is included. Kenya is water scarce. The land size is about 582 thousand square kilometers of which about two percent is water and the water per capita is 500 cubic uh, meters uh, you can compare that with your own countries and there's rapid deterioration of environment in the kenya's water five water towers due to human activity which include deforestation soil erosion and encroachment into the fragile ecosystems uh, the institutions set up under the Water Act 2002 include uh, Ministry of Water and Irrigation. You have my paper somehow, I think you'll get it. So where you see abbreviations, you see them in the main report, main paper. Ministry of Water is responsible for policy making. Then we have the Water Service Trust Fund, which was established under the Water Act to be the source for funding. Uh, water management and water services, which are provided under the WARMA, that's the Water Resource Management Authority. There is the Water Service Regulatory Board, which are all responsible for regulation. Then there's the Catchment Area and Advisory Committee, that's the CACs, and the service providers, these are at the local level. And then we have the Water Resource Users Associations, who are mainly the users and the consumers. This is at the point where I work. Please note that before the Water Act 2002, the Ministry of Water was responsible for all. That's for policy, for management, for service, and for regulation. But after 2002 with the Water Act, these responsibilities were shared. These are the six water catchments that we have in Kenya, and the yellow one is where I am concerned. That is the river Tana catchment. Uh, the basin, that's the Tana basin, covers a big area of Kenya with 22% of Kenya area, and the basin has that 2% of the surface water and 24% of the groundwater. And river Tana, as I've seen, is the biggest and the longest in Kenya with a length of over 1,000 kilometers. 70% of the Kenyan electricity, which is hydro, requirements are produced from this uh, catchment. 80% of the Nairobi city water comes also from the, this basin, from two dams, Ndakaine and Sasumua. 
So the Tana Basin is very significant and important in the Kenyan economy. The key actors in the water sector uh, within this basin, we have the public sector institutions, we have government departments, state authorities, uh, catchment area and advisory committees, the water use associations, water service trust fund, the water appeals board in case of uh, appeals of uh, people contravening the regulations. We have also interest and departments who include the settlers. We have institutions and environmentalists. We have polluters within the catchment area. We have coffee factories, municipalities, industries, sand harvesters, and all other polluters you can think about. We also have the lead and enforcement agencies. Sorry? Uh -huh. We have uh, the enforcement agencies, we have the WARMA, the National Environment Authority, RUAS Judiciary, Public Health, uh, Provincial Administration, and at the community level we have the RUAS. Here we are saying the RUAS is an association of use users, riparian landowners, and other stakeholders who are formally and voluntarily associated for the purpose of cooperatively sharing, managing, and conserving a common water resource. And the purpose is to promote controlled and legal use of the water, promote good management, spearhead water conservation, work towards reducing conflicts, and promote catchment conservation. Instruments for cooperation. We have legislative frameworks. We have all these acts uh, which have been put in place, including the Constitution of Kenya 2010, and incentives for cooperation, including the human rights and legal obligations. Uh, we have equity and sustainable access. We have information exchange and joint monitoring and assessment. Financing the cooperation within the, 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 the catchment. We have the Water Service Trust Fund, which is a pool of resources. We have donors, one of them, of course, is C-Fund and GEF and others. Government departments, companies like Kenjen, Kenya uh, Energy Generating Company, and WC, that's Nairobi Water Company, and communities, uh, sources of funds. Achievements of this cooperation, we have formation and capacity building of the RUAS, legalization of the RUAS, as I said now, once they are legalized, you can sue them, they can also sue. Institutionalization of planning process through participatory preparation of the catchment and subcatchment management plans. Cooperation between farmers, regulators, policy, and financiers. Development of water resources, service, and subservice. Improved equity, access control, efficiency, and sustainability of interventions. Um, barriers to cooperation, we have community perceptions regarding water. It's seen as a gift from, of, of nature. So once the community, you know, they, they may not understand why they need to cooperate in uh, abstracting the water, for example, which is free, given by God. Then in adequate data and information to support decision making, this is quite critical. Then municipal, multiplicity of laws and weak enforcement. Low community capacity in terms of skills compared to the new roles and responsibilities as per the Water Act. Key challenges, financial institutions, like the trust fund is dependent on donor support, inadequate statistical data information for decision making, technological limitations, for example, in water extraction, distribution, and application, poverty, environmental nexus, here we are saying, the higher the poverty levels, of course, the higher the environmental degradation, the high correlation, Customs and beliefs, for example, bush clearing in the upper Tana, uh, low women, um, bush burning, that is, which destroys and uh, a lot of, um, um, a lot of uh, forests, low women and youth access and, uh, to and the control of land, inadequate land loss and weak enforcement, climate change, which we have in global warming, droughts and uh, France, lessons learned, participation of key actors is very, very crucial. Data and information is crucial for decision making. Gender equity, central for sustainability. Accountability is very central. Uh, capacity building, essential. Participation of both upstream and downstream users. At the top uh, upstream, we have the land management issues and the water users uh, at the downstream, which who, who must also all co collaborate. 
replicability of the pilot initiative to other basins uh, through the project uh, interventions has been found to be uh, working. Then uh, just some pictorial rainwater harvesting. This is what the project has been able to achieve. Uh, soil and water conservation. These are some of the project activities. A human wildlife conflict. I say in this high population area, you can see the threat to crops by wildlife. And you see the community are also not very kind to the elephants. They will kill them when they destroy their farms. But at the bottom, you see the project has come up to construct human wildlife barriers through electric fence. For example, groundwater development to augment the surface water uh, through the, 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 the wells and the, the springs protection. Water quality monitoring is very, very important and is uh, supported by the project. Thank you for listening. Very good. I was about to say that you overran your time, but uh, the, you were so impressive in your presentation, I couldn't possibly stop you. That, like that elephant there, right? Um, Antonietta, um, they recently discovered oil in, um, in Kenya, in a very dry border area uh, that hasn't been mentioned by, um, by Faith. But what, meant, what was mentioned by Faith was a very complex institutional setting. Um, we also know from Peru that the major conflicts that are currently occurring in, in the highlands are around water governance between mining corporations, hydropower corporations, and indigenous communities. Um, what uh, have you learned from the, 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 the Kenya case, and what could you offer Kenya as mechanisms to, to bring different views of different parties uh, together. Gracias. Thank you. In the Peruvian case, it is true that we have conflicts with the mining companies, uh, very strong conflicts, in fact. But above all, I think it has been basically the, due to the lack of communication. And I think Kenya is giving us this message. We have to uh, bring together both parties, or both parts. And we are going to implement a small uh, project, uh, one million and a half dollars, I think, precisely to approach or to bring together the uh, positions of the communities using water and the mining industries. And to our surprise, there are some companies that are expressing their interest indeed on uh, working together with the communities. And I think that basically the potential problems could be that according to the Peruvian law, the companies do have to have a, a corporate responsibility uh, law or uh, policy. But this uh, policy in many cases is understood as a paternalism, fatherism, so that uh, they are confused and the attitudes are not the right ones. And in many cases, they just give money without really following where this money is going. But there, is, there are also um, companies that do have a, a good uh, corporate responsibility policy. In this sense, I think we have to really listen to what faith is telling us, because we have to uh, take a model so as to how uh, better meet with the companies and uh, with industries, especially when it is about perceptions and the use of uh, the water as a resource, the different perceptions existing. How to consider these different perceptions? Because in the Peruvian case, the um, high waters where the indigenous people live upstream, they have different visions, and we are not taking these visions into account. There is even a feast of water where all communities gather together, and they, yeah, they tell 
uh, water, they say water is Jakurami, which means more or less that it is a gift from God as well, as in the Kenyan case. Thank you, Antonietta. I think that in your presentation you are going to uh, speak about your mechanisms in detail. Susan? Faith that the Upper Tana is basically a rain-fed area and that soil and water conservation is key to sanitize the, the watershed and improve the livelihoods of uh, half a million people, plus everybody who depends on that water downstream. Now, um, given that um, Faith brought up the importance of land tenure for the use of, um, the better use of, say, uh, water resources, uh, and you in Orisa also have a, uh, a fairly large tribal and uh, indigenous population. Um, what rainwater harvesting or environmental services are possible in, uh, from your point of view in, um, in India that you can extract as lessons from Kenya? Uh, thank you. It was a really refreshing learning from Kenya. India being a welfare state, it's for the state to pay for all types of basic services that the citizen gets. But this concept of payment for ecological services is gaining ground of late. In some of the cities which are situated in the Himalayan foothills, in Sikkim, Discussion regarding payment for ecological services has already started. Basically, we are not able to reach a conclusion because of the disagreement between all the stakeholders. But in India, we still have a law which enforces that anybody who uses forest has to pay a net present value and that amount of money is utilized for the development of the local community. So it is in force, big mining companies and other industrial houses, those who are using the forest, they have to pay a net present value of the forest. But it's a very important learning which we can really replicate and take for our areas in Odisha and India. Even for the drinking water purpose in Kerala, the southern uh, province of India, the Munar Lake, payment for ecological services has already started. Uh, WWF and others are playing a very key role in bringing all the stakeholders on board and coming to a common platform where the user has to pay to the indigenous people, those who are protecting the catchment of those lakes and the drinking water catchment. Excellent news from, uh, from India in terms that uh, there is some exchange, obviously, between the lessons from Kenya and your own even far larger communities that you uh, want to service uh, with the uh, projects and the ongoing uh, below the poverty line schemes you have in India. Umberto. Um, Umberto. I'll stick to, to English just to tease you a bit. Um, faith came up with a criteria for water users associations and water river users associations. And one of the criteria was they are able to sue and be sued. And otherwise, they have a legal capacity and a legal responsibility for the tasks that Faith has enumerated in her presentation. Um, what's the situation in Bolivia like in terms of qualifying or self-qualifying a water user association? Is that defined by their legal capacities to undertake legal action? Or what is the main driver there? Thank you. In Bolivia, we have a problem of uh, over uh, an abundance or an enormous amount of legal mechanisms uh, in terms of water. There is a law for every sector in the water field. Uh, there is a law for electricity, there is a law for allocation of water, etc., that links us uh, with this uh, water sector. Nevertheless, there is no framework, um, bigger umbrella, uh, that allows us to establish the key mechanisms to allocate water. In this sense, 
It is interesting to see how in Kenya they are trying to structure some uh, delegation and subsidiarity mechanisms that may be fundamental to make a good water management. Unfortunately, in Bolivia, the problem is that there is a high empowerment in the, at the communi communal or community level, but there is a lack of authori authority. That means in spite of having sectoral uh, laws, the lack of a framework law and the lack of a higher authority uh, to abide by uh, in the regulations make water management really, really difficult. hecho el puente entre la nueva ley de aguas de, de Kenia y el, la falta de, de una ley marco de autoridad estatal, creo que vamos a abordar el tema más tarde, alrededor del mediodía. Uh, to the plenary. To the plenary. I see one hand. I see two hands. I see two hands. I see three hands. No, I see three fingers. Um, okay, I'll start with, um, with VB. That's the one question, the one name I'll pick up. And then there was Alice. But you will have to introduce yourself and, of course, Josefina. Please uh, state your name and, um, and uh, to who you direct your question, please. I think I have to go first because I have the microphone. I'm Alice. Yes, and my question is, um, <laughs> it's, it's, I heard about the, uh, the new watch act in, in Kenya. So you have the legal framework in place for the participatory approach. And my question is, what are the measures to be taken that women and youth actually have a voice? Because if it's on paper, it's not yet in practice. And then to include the people actually in the Water Use Association and in the RUAS, the voluntary ones, where they not only sit in, but they really articulate their needs, that's yet another step. So I would be most curious about that. Please, Weeby, introduce yourself Hi, again. J.B. Collier from the World Bank. Um, very interesting. Um, presentation on Kenya and working on a water project in Kenya right now. Um, I'm interested to know your perception on the new constitution and how the dev devolution of and creating of county governments and the devolution of um, hopefully some of the power in all the sectors, but particularly the water sector, will hopefully boost the Water Users Association in their their direct interaction. And I'd just like to hear a little bit more. I know you touched on it briefly, but I think that's a, a really exciting thing that's happening in Kenya. But we don't know what's going to happen yet. Uh, very quickly. On, on the issue of land ownership and uh, in relation to the participation issues, you know, to what extent the fact that the women don't have access to land ownership is affecting their, their ability to participate in the water users associations? Because at, at least for, for the experience that... Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So that, that has been a problem, so that you don't have a, a voice because you don't have land, that you don't have the assets. Basically, and and then the, this issue in relation to the to the principle of authority, I don't know in 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 countries where there is no that kind of level of authority or legal framework, that's where the water uses associations work better is the self-organizing principles, and that's that's in a way was previous to the existing of the existence of of the of the, um, the overall framework. So, leave it with you. Okay, we have one question from the former session that was promised to be answered now, so can you repeat it, please? Yeah, it was that uh, after implementing the green water credit system, if that had helped to uh, enhance the cooperation um, among the different irrigation communities, and if it has been continued after the project from ISRIC, I think, finished. Thank you. Uh, well, Faith, I think you can do a PhD now. <laughs> You've got the question of devolution to counties, boosting the water users, measures to give women a voice, which is contextualized with the land ownership. So I think you can combine those two. 
And I think the issue of self-organizing water users, RUAS, and state principles will be addressed later on. So I'll, I'll relieve you of that one. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll start with the women uh, issues on uh, the, both the voice and the issue of uh, ownership of, uh, of land. As I said, there was a recent creations of the Water Act 2002. And at the community level, when we talk about the water users, these are the people who are abstracting water for various uses. The water could be for domestic use, it could be for irrigation, it could be for running the coffee factories, the, um, the, 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 the tanning um, uh, factories, and, and all those. So all those are water users and also the riparian communities who are around the river basins. The formation of the Water User Association, which is a local institution within subcatchments, we, as a project, we have been facilitating formation of us through dividing the rivers, the various rivers within the Mount Kenya area into sections, subcatchments, which we call subcatchments. And when the communities are erecting the readers who are going to be part of this association to take the leadership role, we actually use affirmative action. Because in Kenya, we also have the, the gender policy. And in the policy, it's very much cre uh, indicated. And even in the Kenyan constitution 2010, in fact, there was a clause, there is a clause in the constitution that that percent of elective positions must be from one gender, either men or women. So because women have always been disadvantaged when it comes to decision-making organizations, this is the point where women representation becomes mandatory in the wars. And therefore, we are able to get the voices of the women at that level. So that when we are developing the water, whether it's for domestic use or for irrigation, the women must participate in the decision making. So I, I think I'll be, I think Madam Alice will be comfortable with that. When it comes to land ownership, although the women do not own the land, the title deed is in the name of the man, but the woman works the land. So in these activities in the farm, the planting of the tree, the, the, the coffees, the tea, the food crops, mostly it's the women who are involved. And therefore, when they're involved, we support them through the farmer organizations. And again, this is where they, pray, they come to play a big role. When they are organized, they are able to, 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 to improve the food security and also the incomes, although they don't, they don't own the land. But again, within, we have a very good constitution, Constitution 2010, ownership of land. Women are free to own land. And even through heredity, these days a woman con can contest uh, that the father has refused to give him a piece of land. Just if you are a female child, just like the male child, so it's now in the constitution. So issues of accessing the land uh, through the legal mechanism are now in the constitution. Uh, about the devolution uh, in the yeah the, the devolution of uh, uh, to the counties. The next project, I say the, the Mount Kenya project is ending. In fact, it is already concluded. But we are upscaling to the upper Tana, the, the rest of the parts of the upper Tana. And the design of the upper Tana project is based on the new constitution, which is giving powers, a lot of powers, to the counties where decisions will be made. These decisions are not only on... Um, on uh, the natural resources within the counties. But within the constitution, there are those resources which cut across the different counties where there will be environmental committees for, the, for, the, for various counties where they are sharing the resources, like the water, and also the decisions on accessing the water within the county, and also the resources, the money. Within the new constitution, uh, there's a certain percentage of national resources, I think 15%, which must go to the counties. And the county governor, the county representative, and we have a women representative from the counties, they will be playing key role in decision-making at the county level through the new devolved 
uh, system of government. But will the WUAS be also playing a role in the county development plans? I think that's where JB is going to. Yes, of course, there will be the county development plans where the WUAS, the, all the prayers from the various sectors will be playing a critical role, and it's within the constitution also. About the green water credit, again, uh, I would say that the concept of green water we tend, as a project, we have been removing the one credit because of the connotation that when you talk of credit, you are talking of monies. But as I said, in the upstream, the activities we have been emphasizing on so that there's increased water in the rivers is soil and water conservation. This is part of the green water, you know, the, the, I, I think my colleague Gobert is going to talk about the green water uh, activities in a few moments uh, time, but we have been focusing more or less on the soil and water conservation activities. Well, and even the Upper Tana project will still, uh, will replicate the same in the other parts of the Upper Tana. I may suggest that um, um, Beatrice seeks uh, some inputs here directly from Godet. If you can put up your hand, Godet, she may pick you up over coffee. All right, can you please then I would like to thank all of you for your um, wonderful action panelists, presenters, audience, plenary uh, for the first session. Now, here's some housekeeping. All papers are outside in the display table. Now, I don't know if they're in the display table, but anyway, all papers are available. Second, I'm told here in very big fact letters that I have to remind you to sign up for the field visits tomorrow. Otherwise, you don't get your DSA, which means the United Nations will not pay for your hotel bill if you don't go to the field. Would you please fill in your field visits by coffee time this morning? Yeah, if not, Andrea will make sure you do. Right? And um, that's, of course, a teaser. So, with that, may I invite you back at a quarter past 11 sharp, and may I also invite the next set of presenters to come to the table so that we can download their presentations. Thank you very much, and see you at 11.15.